So let me start by just saying thank you. Thank you for choosing to come and worship today. Uh, you could have done a lot of other things this morning. Could have slept in, could have went out to brunch, could have uh, just chose to go to another church. You could have chose to do a lot of other things, but instead, you chose to be here today. And I think this is a great chance for us to lean in, to learn a little bit. We've had some powerful worship already today, and now we get a chance to lean in and just see what God may have in store for us. So what I'd love to do is just everybody to lean in. We're going to be in Deuteronomy 30. If you happen to have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn there. We'll get there in a minute. But if not, we'll have it on the screen for you. My name is Frank. I'm one of the pastors here. Pastor Chris normally preaches for us. If you don't like the message, he'll be back next week. If you do like the message, please find him and tell him. I'm looking for a raise. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, so, hey, listen, I want to start by sharing something I recently read in this book by this psychologist named Barry Schwartz. Barry wrote this book called The Paradox of Choice. And he explains that while we, why we have trouble committing, he says why we love to keep our options open, he says that as a culture we demand choice. We demand options. We imagine that more options mean more freedom. And most people think that limitless freedom must be a good option. But Schwartz writes, and this is really ironic, that apparently limitless choice doesn't actually make us happy. The number of choices available to us becomes overwhelming and actually makes it difficult for us to ever have the joy of fully committing to anything or anyone. There's this pressure against us. We've all seen this. Those of you that are parents have gone out to the ice cream shop and you've taken your little kiddo with you and the choice in front of them of those 32 flavors is just absolutely overwhelming. And they're looking there and they're like, I love the Superman ice cream because it makes my tongue change colors. But then I like this ice cream as well. And they go back and forth and they finally decide when they decided that originally they were going to ask, can they have nine scoops? And you're like... Keep it to two, and they choose their two for the perfect combination, and they go to line, and they are so proud of what they have chosen, but then the kid that walks up behind them chose something else, and suddenly their ice cream looks less awesome. You know, in that moment, haven't even paid for it yet. It's ice cream. It's all awesome. You can't ultimately make a bad decision there, but from a very early age, we sit there and we look between the two. We're like... Oh, I, I think this is what I want to do. I, th I, think I, I, th I think I want this one. And we get unsure when we're in the toy aisle and we're trying to pick the different color toy or whatever it may be. And then as we get older, those decisions just get a little more complicated. But the reality of it being hard for us to make the right choice is very, very present for us. And so it's just this interesting tension that each of us face. And here's the thing. Even if we do commit, even if we do make a choice, we finally decide what we're going to do, the car we're going to buy, where we're going to move, the school we're going to send our kids to, whatever it is, once we make that choice, our culture makes us feel dissatisfied with the choice we've made. It's like, gosh, even, even when we're making a choice, we feel like it's the right one. Someone has an opinion. Someone has some thought to give on why that wasn't the right choice. And it's like, geez, I'm just trying to make great choices. Well, here's what I've learned. Making choices in general is hard. Making choices well is even harder. Making choices well that factor in our faith is even more difficult. So as I mentioned, we're going to be in Deuteronomy 30 today. We've been studying the life and leadership of Moses. And there's this idea, and I'm warning you in advance, this is a big idea that we are going to work over the next 30 minutes or so, 30 minutes and 36 seconds, uh, to boil down to something very, very practical. But it starts, it's a very big idea. Deuteronomy 30, 15, it says this. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. Okay, seems like a terrible option of choices. This is very obvious, right? Life or death, I choose life. Peril, destruction, or blessings, prosperity, uh, blessings, prosperity. I mean, this seems kind of obvious what we would choose, right? Now, remember, Moses is old at this point. Um, not kind of sort of old, but like really, really, really old at this point. He's going to die. He's not going to go into the promised land. And this is some of his last teaching that he's sharing. So he says, I said this before you. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him. And to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land 
you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you're not obedient, and if you're drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you'll certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call the heavens and the earth as a witness against you that I have set before you today life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, and hold fast to him. That idea where he says, now choose life, seems very obvious. Life is a big idea, massive idea. The idea of, okay, I'm going to choose life. I'm going to choose blessing. I'm going to choose all this, this really, really big idea. How do I choose that? Because that is obvious. And yet, what I hope to propose to you today that we'll wrestle with is that there are some decisions we are making on a regular basis where we are choosing the opposite of life. We are choosing those things to remove the opportunity for God to bless us, remove the opportunity for us to really enjoy the full life, the success, the prosperity, the future that God has in store for us. We are actually making choices that hinder that, even though we would say we choose life. It's a tension to manage for sure. Now, in this scripture, we see a phrase. A phrase is so that. So that is in your Bible a lot. And I would like to encourage you that when you come across it moving forward, that you pause for just a second. When you see so that, so that's found in Scripture, it's this link between a command and idea, okay? This idea, this big idea, this command, and a promise. Over and over and over again throughout Scripture we see it. So here he says, now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God and listen to your vo his voice and Hold fast to him. Seems like a good reason. Choose life. That's the commandment. That's the commissioning to us. And look at all this good stuff that comes as a result. When you choose life, it says you choose to love the Lord. When you choose life, you choose to listen and obey him. When you choose life, you choose to hold him. Take hold of him. Have confidence. Have an anchor. Have a rock to keep you stable no matter what goes on around you. Choose life. The problem is, while it seems obvious, it's not particularly easy, especially when we have to make a decision, multiple decisions, every day to do so. Now, I'll illustrate it this way. Um, five, six years ago, I took up mountain biking, okay? And I would love to get up early before the kids got up, and I would go hit the trails, and I would usually get to the parking lot where the trails were while it was still dark. Like, should not go out on the trails yet. Be one of the first people there, get my tires ready, pedal around the parking lot before anybody's there, get warmed up, and just wait on the sun to rise. It's a great way to start. Worked out great. Our son, James, was doing cross country at the time, and I dropped him off at a, a run, a meet that he was getting ready for. He was going to be going for a few hours before the rest of us could come watch the last 20 seconds of the race where it's like, yay, you finished. And so you don't get to watch them run. And so I drop them off and I go up there and I do my normal routine. Get out the bike, check the tire pressure, adjust my seat, go for some rides around the parking lot. It's me and one other person in the parking lot because it's not even daytime yet. The sun starts to break, warm up my legs, and I hit the trails. Now I've rode this trail time and time again. Okay, so I'm cutting through. I really enjoy this trail. It's not particularly hard. It has some great fast spots in it, right? So I'm weaving around, and I'm getting to my favorite spot where, according to my little map, my ride, I come down the hill going 21 to 23 miles an hour. I'm cooking down through this trail that's not super wide, but wide enough for me not to die, okay? And so I'm coming down through there, but there was something different this morning. You see, as I was coming down the trail, I see off in the distance a herd of deer. The problem with these deer is they are dumb like every other deer, right? And so I'm like, oh, are they going to run in front of me? What's going to happen? And so I pump my brakes for just a second to notice another deer all by himself over here. And so I'm like, okay, are you about to shoot across here? Do you care I exist? I'm processing all this while I'm now going like 15 or 16 miles an hour, right? I'm cruising down through there and I'm like, oh, he's going to chill. It's fine. 
So I go ahead and open it back up. I'm zooming down this hill. This is all happening in a matter of a few seconds. Get down there, get toward the bottom, right when I'm getting up my top speed, and that deer raises its head up. And I look just for a second, and that's all it took. Just a second, as you know, if you drive a motorcycle or a bike, it takes just a second for your eyes to follow, your hand, or handlebars will follow where your eyes go, right, immediately. So I look up, see the deer, tilt just a little bit, just enough for the very edge, less than an inch of my handlebars to catch a tree. Well, see what happens is when you're on a bike and suddenly the tire is facing this direction, you go this direction, and so I went sailing. I bit it. Hard, guys. Helmet right into the dirt. I go sliding, cuts me all up, knocks my AirPods out of my ears. I mean, this was like a whole thing. And then I'm like, what do I do at this point? Like, how do I manage this? And my solution was very simple. Get back on my bike and sulk the rest of the ride back. Like, I can't go back the way I came up the hill. So I man up and I bleed my way back to my car, right? So it's like, yeah, I did it. Okay. But here's the thing. That distraction... That moment was very costly. When we're making choices, there are these little moments, these little choices that we make that can have some serious impact. Speaking of choices, I'm going to pause the message for just a moment and let all of you make a choice. The choice is this. I need one person from each section, total of six sections. This is a section, that section, that section, that section, that section, that section. Six sections. I need each of you to look at each other and send a tribute to come up and be part of an illustration up here on stage with me. They do not have to say any words, but I need six people to come now. And it's really awkward if you don't hurry because then we're all standing here wasting time and I know you all want to get to lunch. So I need six people to come on stage. Come on, everybody. Six people. I got one. Oh, my son's coming. Okay. I got two, I got three, I got four, I got a lady, hurry, hurry, I got, I got multiple people moving now, there's no way to get up down that way unless you want to get baptized, you have to come to this side, sorry, so I will keep you on your toes, come over this way, all right, everybody's going to stand right here, um, start right here on this T, and then kind of bunch up over here together, everybody over here together, over here, over here. I'll move this table. That'll drive everybody crazy up there. Yeah, just kind of bunch together. Be friends. Uh, be friends. Like to come up here together right in this area. That's perfect. Stand there and smile, and I'll get back to you in a few minutes. It's fine. So good job. You guys made a great choice today. Well, we'll decide if it's a great choice based on their performance. But we'll assume that you made a great choice today. So here we are. I want to share this idea with you this morning. Big idea that has very simple, practical implications at the end of the connected choice. So I need you guys to scoot down this way a little bit. Mike, you come down like five more feet or whatever. Come all the way in to where you guys are really close. Not that far. That was like 30 feet. Uh, it's fine. Come on. Scoot, scoot over. Scoot over. Scoot over. Come on this way. Come on this way. Come this way. This way. Just get like close to each other like you're not like afraid of each other. It's fine. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Jennifer. Come on. 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 All right, sir. Your name is? Josh. Josh. You're Jesus. J Jesus, come stand right here. Uh, great. Uh, great. I feel great about this. Jesus, don't let go of me, okay? All right. All right. Everybody, come. you guys kind of come right here. Be shoulder to shoulder with Josh all the way down. And then uh, everybody hold this rope. It'll be great. It'll be great. It'll be great. It'll be great. Perfect. You guys are doing great. Now, everybody take like one step backwards. Great. Awesome. Stand there. It's fine. It's fine. Great. They're doing such a great job, guys. You guys cho chose very well. They're all holding the rope. They haven't done anything wrong. They're winning at life. I want to share the idea of the connected choice. I believe that choices, our choices, must have connection to purpose and people all the time. Your choices must have connection to Purpose and people all the time, whether those be really big choices or small choices. So here's the idea. Jesus, Josh, take a little bit more of the rope. Why are they taking away from it? They got all that rope down there, and they're like pulling it. Let's move this way, guys. Move this way. There, there we go. Let, let it breathe. Let it breathe a little bit. All right. Gosh, you guys are putting a strain on Jesus. Wow. That's, that's all right. That's all right. So I got Josh here. Josh is Jesus, and my goal in life is to make my choices and decisions up close to him. Right? 
knowing what he wants, in the will of God, making those right choices. So here I am, Jesus, Josh, and I are making the right decisions. This isn't particularly hard to do at church on Sunday morning, right? No distractions, no problems, pretty easy to make the right choice and decision because here I am with Jesus. Like it would be kind of weird if you did something against Jesus in here, right? We're here at church. The problem is we don't have just church and Jesus, right? We have Jennifer with work, we have life, we have marriage, we have all these circumstances, we have these friends, some awesome friends, some not so awesome friends. Well, that's my son, I'm just picking on him, right? And so, so all these friends here. And so it feels like, it feels like when we're making choices, our faith-based choices, when we're trying to make the right choices around really big things to really small things, we're trying to find our way to stay connected to Jesus. But throughout our life, throughout our day, there are people and or things in between us. Right? That's a true statement, right? There are things in between us. There are people that, oh, well, I don't want to mention Jesus while I'm at work because I'm not allowed to. And so I like have to watch very careful. So I'm trying to make the right choice. I'm trying to figure this out. And all I want to propose to you is that all of your choices, big choices and small choices, must be connected to our faith. Okay, got it, got it? So far so good? So all these things, these are just things, not people. These are things. They're sometimes distractions, not necessarily good, not necessarily bad, just things in our life that are in between us sometimes and a clear, direct connection with Jesus, right? There are things that just are a little bit of a distraction, right? I'm just trying to focus. I'm trying to stay connected. I'm trying to make the right choices of what Jesus has called me to do. Jesus, Josh, is guiding me. But now I feel like sometimes it's a little, little hard to see what I'm supposed to do. It's a little unclear. But if I can just stay connected, ultimately I'll be okay. The problem I want to propose to you is that when it comes to our choices, there are way too many times that small choices are handled like this. We treat them as though this choice is somehow independent of our faith and independent of everything else in our life. So we'll take a choice, whether it be something really simple in our life, like buying a car or where we're going to move or the school we're going to select or whatever. Sometimes we'll lean in on Jesus for all that and we'll get really close to Jesus, Josh, to help us make this decision. In fact, sometimes we'll get everybody else out of our way, everything else out of our way and get really close because we've been wrestling with this decision. Lord, we need your help to make this decision. And so we're drawing close because this decision feels like it really matters. Problem is, most of the decisions that you make on a daily, daily basis, day in, day out, may or may not even feel like we need Jesus to help us. Right? Some of the decisions we make, like uh, you're going out to lunch, steak or chicken. I don't know if you need to ask Jesus about that one. I don't know. Maybe you do. Pray, bless the people that made it. That'd be great. Yeah, bless the food. But I, I don't know that we need Jesus for that one. Maybe we do. I don't know. You guys could ask that. But here's where I'm at. So many young people, and it, it starts there, but then it just kind of infiltrates through our lives. We become self-sufficient. So many of you, you live in Forsyth County or the surrounding area. Overall, our county's doing just fine. We have support systems and structure, and we have good infrastructure and good homes and good places to be and good people around us. And we have a nice church, and we don't have anything to worry about today. We're fine. So because we're fine, we will choose to make decisions independent, disconnected from our faith. And what I want to propose to you to tie it all the way back to the Scripture is that when Moses said, choose life, Choose life so that all those other things can be true. Choose life. That choice is made with each and every choice, not just one time. Can you guys put the rope down and go back to your seat and everybody give them a round of applause. You know what? They weren't terrible. Good job, guys. You did good. You did good. So as I mentioned, choices must have a connection to purpose and people as I call it, the connected choice. But here's the thing. If there's a connected choice, that means there's also unconnected choices. Here's what I've learned. 
unconnected choices, when we don't include Jesus, when we don't include our faith as part of the decision, rarely lead to blessings. Rarely lead to blessings. Even if it feels short-term that it's a good slick decision or it's a good financial decision or whatever it may be, I've just found over my lifetime and the people that I've had the privilege to counsel and pastor here and throughout my life that the reality is when we take a shortcut, when we choose to drop the connection to Jesus, even sometimes when it feels a little removed, when we drop that connection and try to make an independent decision, even if it has good initial financial consequences to it or, or um, it feels like it seems obvious, when we do that from time to time, when that starts to creep in, it does two things. One you have the consequences of that choice that may or may not be blessed. Okay? So that's tough in and of itself. The other thing that it allows to do in your life is you are slowly but surely giving yourself permission to need Jesus just a little less. So, yeah, I may or may not need him to make what seems like an obvious decision. Oh, I want to do this. It seems obvious. It's so cut and dry. Financially, it means this. Or with this relationship, it's so obvious. If I don't include Jesus in that as part of that faith decision, if I don't feel like most every choice I make in life is a faith decision, if I don't think that way, then what's going to end up happening is I am slowly making deposits that say I don't have to include faith as part of some of my decisions. The problem is throughout Scripture we see example of people that got very confident, very capable. Suddenly what ended up being some very small decisions that they chose not to include their faith in become big decisions. Suddenly they're like, well, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. Suddenly we're not approaching Jesus around what could be some massive decisions. And yet, as I said, unconnected choices rarely are tied to blessings. It's interesting. Unconne unconnected choices, the problem with them is that they typically are very, very easy or very, very difficult. Okay? So it's in the middle somewhere along the way that we're like, I really need Jesus and I draw close to Jesus. But what happens is we start our unconnected choices by taking a posture of like, oh, oh, this is just a little something. It's just a little big idea, little idea. You may not even consciously disconnect from Jesus. You just don't invite him in on the conversation. It's so easy. It's so obvious I'm going to do this. So suddenly we make this small choice and don't include Jesus. The other thing that's interesting is sometimes we will agonize over something, wrestling between two goods and not include Jesus. So it's really difficult. We're trying to figure out, do we want to do this or do this? Do we sell our house because the housing market's great? Maybe we rent a house for two years and we flip it. We're going to make all this money and do this. And you're having this whole plan. We could do that in Forsyth County, right? Um, we could do, oh, this whole plan is going to work. I'm going to rent for two years and this is going to happen. And it seems to make total sense on paper. But at what point do we ask Jesus to be a part of the conversation? Problem is when it's really logical, sometimes we're like, well, Jesus just wants us to make a good decision. So we don't invite him in to give his input through scripture, through loved ones that share our same faith, um, through prayer, through the Holy Spirit, just letting us know that something just doesn't feel right about this and maybe we shouldn't move forward. You know, can't always explain it, but it's, there's great value in it. <laughs> Here's the thing. When we make choices that are unconnected, the fallout is more significant than we will recognize initially and may even want to recognize. The other place that it starts when we have unconnected choices, some of it is just the really, really small choices, the really, really small things that seem so obvious I don't even need Jesus' help. Okay, that's a problem. The other ones are simply the things that we know what Jesus would tell us to do. We just don't like it. So we're not going to do it, right? And the challenge that we all have is everybody in this room is we've picked one or two things that don't apply to us. I mean, I'm just being honest, right? All of us struggle with one or two things that we're like, we know what Jesus says. We know what we're supposed to do. 
And yet, for whatever reason, we have justified in our life, in our circumstances, in our situations, that that does not apply to us. It's this radical thinking. You're like, it's like, why do we get there? And so I want to rewind back to Deuteronomy chapter 30 where he says, choose life or death. It seems so obvious. And yet we will make decisions going, I know what I'm supposed to do. But those are the very things I don't do, as Paul wrote. How do we get there? If life and death seem so obvious, how do we find these things, these handful of things in our life that we just choose don't apply to us? You know, I think it starts with those little choices I mentioned earlier. The confidence in those little things to go, I don't really need my faith. I don't need Jesus to help me make this decision because it's so clear. It's so obvious. I don't need help with that. I think that creates something in us. In those little things, when our faith is in an active conversation, when we're actively not pursuing and growing and working, I think it's when we start to let that happen in our lives, when we allow that to happen, that we open up a room in our heart for justification. Justification of why it doesn't apply to us. Let me give you a few examples and step all over your toes, okay? Um, so example, um, volunteering at church, okay? Lots of uh, people volunteer at church. Church didn't fall apart today. All your kids got taken care of. They probably don't need me, right? Very easy justification. I've been working really long hours. I've been doing this. I've been doing that. Easy to justify why we don't volunteer at church, right? It's easy. It genuinely is quite easy to justify it and not feel bad about it, right? Uh, when it comes to uh, working with God on our finances, all of us have other expenses, other, all of us have challenges and things and reasons why we're, oh, well, we're helping so-and-so or we're going to do this first and then we're going to do this. Pastor Chris talked about this a little bit last week about, gosh, when we experience success, what do we do with that money? How does that work? It's so easy for us to go, well, everybody else does this, but we're in this situation. You know, so it's different for us. It's different for me. We're in a different place. We're in a different place relationally. We're, we're in a different place where that doesn't apply to us. How do we get there? What is it that would allow us to have that kind of level of thinking to where we can go, Jesus, we will pick and choose. The irony is that in and of itself is a massive choice. That's a massive choice. It's a massive choice and decision for us to go, I know what I'm supposed to do. Jesus, I'm having a hard time seeing you. There are a lot of other things going on, but I'm connected. Like, I'm still holding on to you. I need you in my life, but not for this. It's a big decision. I believe that that's what Moses is writing about when he's like, no, 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 choose life. Please, please don't miss this. Choose life. Don't miss out on this opportunity. God has got great prosperity and future, and he's given you this promised land that you've been navigating for so long. Don't miss out on it. By all means, please don't miss this. I can hear Moses going, I'm not going in, but you are. Please enjoy it. Enjoy everything that God has in store for you. And I believe that's what happens in Scripture. We have this in John 10.10. 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but... I have come, Jesus has come to give us life and give it to us to the full. So unless we believe that Jesus is a liar and he wasn't being truthful with that, what in the right mind puts us in a position where we can go, God, I trust you with almost everything, but I'll keep this. It's kind of a crazy thing that we do. I'll be honest with you, I navigate it, my family navigates it, we all are trying to figure it out, right? We're just, you know, we're all trying to figure this out. But what I hope to do is that this morning the Holy Spirit would just work on you and point out that one thing that you've said, Jesus, I've got this one. I don't need any assistance. Because most of us have that. Most of us have that area of life that we justify. Now, here's the thing. If you're not careful your mind can easily go to judging others or justifying based on other people's behaviors, right? You'll either go, well, I do all these other things, so it's okay if I don't do this one thing that Jesus asked me to do. That's one way. The other thing is to go, well, I'm doing more than they are, whoever they is, right? I'm doing more than they're doing. It's like, since when is that person your standard, right? I'll, I'll be honest with you. Jess and I, before we got married, we were tithing, 
like we had just agreed, that was good for us. One of the reasons that we started tithing, I've never stopped, is because I was a new believer. I was only a couple years in my faith, and I was just so thankful in the Bible, I found one thing that was very specific. It was like, do this to this percentage of this way. I'm very logical. I would really appreciate it if Jesus would say, I need you to pray 20 minutes a day. I need you to read your Bible 13 minutes and 47 seconds a day. Whatever it is, I would do it. I'm, I'm a rule follower. I would totally do that. But in this scenario, I got all this relational squishy stuff that I got to figure out how much I do with what. But then I got this one thing I can get right if I do it with the right heart. So it was like, okay, we're going to do that right. Jess, I don't know if we're going to do anything else right. We're going to do that right. So honestly, that's never been a tension for us to navigate if we were going to tithe about something. That's just not been a big one. But there's been other stuff that we've had to navigate. For you, it may be that finances, that was never that one piece that you were comfortable to let go of. And you look around at our church, and you look around, and it's like the lights are still on. We got a new baptistry. We recently got some new cameras. They don't need my money. And that's how you justify it. And you're right. I mean, we're doing fine financially. But this isn't about us. This is about your relationship between God and money. Like, this is for you, not us, right? And so it's so easy it's so easy for us to justify and go, well, they're doing less or they're doing more. Um, I did show this in the first service, but it's this interesting thing that my family is wired with this. We have this justice streak inside of us, okay? And so my son, Isaac, um, he, he's playing football and was doing basketball before that. And with basketball, it's funny. He will push, push, push himself first. Really, really hard. He's a real hard worker, okay? But when he sees someone else that's slacking or being lazy, his tolerance level's pretty low. Pretty low with that before he's just yelling at him. <laughs> like, come on, suck it up, get it together. You could do more, you could do more, you could do more. Like the tolerance level, that push is there. Go, ah, oh, you have to do this. Here's the thing. For him, sports, he's super passionate about that right now. For Micah, it's cars. Whatever it is that you're like passionate about in the season you're in, you're going to be super passionate about that. So Jess and I have always tithed and we're really thankful. We believe that God's blessed us through that. And we'll give you all kinds of illustrations and examples of how God has moved through our finances. And we believe he's blessed that by choosing life. All of you have those examples of areas where you're getting it right. I believe that where you fought for family or you stepped in for adoption or foster care or whatever it is, where you're getting it right. The problem is if you use that as your justification to get something else wrong, we're missing it somewhere. Right? We're totally missing it somewhere. We're all nodding our head. Literally, you guys are going, yep, yep, that's true, that's true. I just want you to like, I need to give, I should have gave everybody a mirror today <laughs> just so you could like be really like this when you did this, right? Here's the thing. If you are trying to lose weight, okay, the problem in America right now, the tension, okay, and this ties perfectly to this. If you're trying to lose weight, I'll tell you why most people don't end up making much progress. Because they start doing something, working out, eating healthier, whatever it may be. And two days later, that justifies them having a splurge. And they undermine the very thing that they made the progress with. You just do that over and over and over and over again. You're like, oh, I don't know, make any progress. I'm always working out. Well, you're almost always working out, and then you're counteracting it on those other days, right? The same is true with our choices. Gosh, when it's like, I don't understand why the Lord won't bless me. I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. And the first thing I want to look at you and say is, but what about that that you didn't mention? How are you doing with that? Maybe that's hindering your opportunities. Maybe that's where you're choosing death and destruction instead of life. And blessing. Now, here's the good news. We don't have to be perfect. And it doesn't matter how far we get removed. Where we're totally in the dark. You can't even see me anymore. I'm so far away. But as long as I'm still just holding on to some inkling of faith, Jesus is there to help us make those choices and make the progress. It doesn't matter how far removed we get. If we can just simply hold on a little. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to sing one more song together. And what I would encourage you to do is when I was talking just a few moments ago about that thing that you just choose to make your own choice, that you justify, that you don't include Jesus in on any of that conversation, the cool thing was I didn't have to get very specific on examples because Jesus did that for us 
through the Holy Spirit, you already know exactly where you struggle with that. It was very obvious. But I didn't have to make a list of here's 47 things. Choose which one most applies to you. Jesus did that for us today. So that thing that came zinging in your heart, that was like, that's where I know what I'm supposed to do, but choosing not to do it. Let's wrestle with that today. During this last song, if we really believe that Jesus is the greatest, that he's the great I am, that he is our Lord, he's our Savior, that we're supposed to lean in and give everything to him, what about that? And where do we go from here when it comes to that issue? Let's take this worship song for you to have a conversation with God through prayer, through singing, whatever it is, to go, God, you brought it up to me. We're wrestling with it now. Now what do we do with it? Is that okay? Let's go ahead and stand on our feet. I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll sing one more song together. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for what you allow us to be a part of. Thank you for giving us a word today to wrestle with. Jesus, we all want to choose life. We want to choose you. We lean in on you. We find our hope in you. You're our rock. You're our anchor. We know that any time we try to make decisions without you, it has these terrible, difficult consequences. So today, Jesus, we want to make you center again. We want to lean in on you. Let you be the center of our decisions. Not just some of them, but all of them. God, we want to see you move in our lives in a powerful way. And we wouldn't want to do anything to hinder you using us to have a significant impact on those around us. Father, we love you and pray that you'll just enjoy this worship time together and work greatly in our hearts. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.